Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Iconicast podcast, episode six. Believe it or not, we've been at this for a while. I'm Professor Geek, your host, and you may have been wondering where the heck our our episode was for the month of July. <laughs> I do try to keep these as monthly as possible. Schedules were a little bit, you know, part of the problem. It was a busy month, but honestly, I had a topic that I wanted to talk about, which I'm going to talk about today. But it really required me to order my thoughts, to do a little bit of study, to really, you know, make sure that I was ready to come on camera and on mic and and speak about it and give you guys, you know, the best uh, information I could and, and hopefully be engaging. So that's why it took a little long. We had to take July off. That's a bummer. But here we, we are back for August. And the upside is we are only three episodes away from our official Halloween episode in October. So we're going to do August episode, a September episode, and an October episode. We're going to begin our Halloween content now. If you follow me on my channel, I've been talking about this on my YouTube channel, that is. I've been talking about this. So today we're going to start the content and I'm going to talk about the night that changed everything. Certainly for horror fans, and that's a very big umbrella term, right? In, in one sense, I would say I'm not even a horror fan because I don't like a lot of the slashers and just gratuitous gore and stuff like that. You know, other people love that and they would call themselves horror fans, but I would still call myself a horror fan. Maybe you can parse you know, it out and say, well, I'm more of a terror fan. I love a good monster movie. And, and if a slasher film is done well and has a good monster, like, you know, the first Halloween film, John Carpenter's Halloween is a classic masterpiece in my in my view. Wes Craven's New Nightmare, classic, just a masterpiece and so on. So I, I do like horror, but horror is a big term. So don't be turned off if you think, well, you don't like horror. Uh, you might very well like more than you think you do. For example, what we're going to talk about is the classic monsters, the classic archetypes, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Mummy, good old classic universal monster movies. And if you're at all even remotely interested in those characters and what they do for our society, then you're interested in this one night that I'm talking about, maybe a week, if you stretch it out that most, that, that changed everything. It's a very important night slash week. You know, maybe it was a couple of nights, but probably just at least one night you can point to that was the big game changer, the, the night that changed everything in the year of 1816, the summer of that year. So we'll get to that in a moment. But we're going to talk about that, and then I'm going to give you some physical media reviews, a couple of DVDs that are related to that night, and then we'll end up by continuing our series on the archetypes. If you remember last episode, we started getting into the sub-archetypes. We talked about the trickster. This time around, we're going to talk about the frontiersman. So that's coming up. A lot of good stuff this episode. Stick around. Hello, Al Pals. This is Big Al of Big Al Presents on YouTube. Join me for reviews, rewatches, and ramblings about the films and TV of today and yesteryear. If you want to know what I think about the current crop of films and theaters, check out my 10 word reviews. And if you love watching films with your buddies, please join me for Films with Friends as me and my friends watch a great old movie and invite you to join us. I'll make sure we do our best to provide you with a link to the film during the live stream as we're watching it so you can tell us what you think about the movie as well. So if you're a fan of films, please join me, Big Al, on Big Al Presents on YouTube. Subscribe and be official the night that changed everything for horror fans and even if you're not a horror fan the night that had amazing profound repercussions on our culture that's quite a quite a setup am i going to be able to deliver on that and and i think so it is going to take some time and some cultural context okay so Unless I keep you in suspense any longer, some of you may have guessed. I am talking about the night of the summer of 1816. It's It's been talked about a lot. There have been movies made about it. It's, it's in all of the history books if you're interested in these authors. It was a night in which Mary Shelley, author of Frankenstein, who would be the author of Frankenstein, um, 
her soon to be husband, who's currently married to somebody else at the time. We'll talk about that. <laughs> Percy Shelley, who's one of the romantic poets, Percy Shelley, Mary and Percy, Lord Byron, Mary's half sister, who's in sort of a menage a trois thing going on with her and Percy, Claire, and then John Polidori. These five individuals were sharing this castle in Switzerland. And it was a summer, a dark and stormy summer. There had been a volcano that erupted uh, in, in Europe there, and it was having effects on the climate. And so it was a dark, colder than usual, stormy summer. They're there in the mountains. There are uh, stories of, of an individual actually called Frankenstein, the house of the, uh, of the rocks, who was, was doing experiments on, on dead bodies to the south of where they were. They're, they're in this haunted mountain. Mount Blanc is there. These locations that show up in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as well as a lot of Percy's poems and whatnot. Uh, they, they, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more of the context here in a second, but the point is they have this competition while they're there stuck inside this dark, cold, stormy summer into this castle. They have a competition who can frighten each other. And so they dare each other to tell ghost stories. Ultimately, we get Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And the story arises called The Vampire. And we'll talk about where how that arises more. But that is one of the major influences of what would be Dracula. Now, Bram Stoker, it took him to come along and give us a literary masterpiece and, and develop the character and everything. But the idea of a vampire in modern times, what would that look like? Very much, you know, Bram Stoker drew that idea from this short story that was um, had its origins in this night. So it's truly a night that changed everything. Because I would argue that even if you're, say, a modern horror fan, if you like the slashers and, and the, you know, the, the extreme, whatever's coming out now, even if you, you would say, I don't really like, you know, a vampire movie or you know, even that's too old school for you, you still owe everything you do like to those archetypes, to those foundational types that have come before. And even if you're not necessarily a horror fan, I say this still has important repercussions to you because this is the night that created these symbols, these icons that are reflecting back the fears and anxieties of our culture. And a lot of those fears and anxieties are still with us from that moment on because of this cultural context that I'm going to get into now. Okay, so I set up, I've told you about the night that we want to talk about. It is important to give you some cultural context, and this might take a while, so settle in, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. The reason we can trace even today in the 2020s, you know, uh, our culture back to this moment in 1816 is because of what was going on culturally then with the Enlightenment is still with us today. Now, if you opened up a history of Western culture, Western civilization textbook, it's going to start with probably the Medo-Persians. It'll say something about the Code of Laws with the Code of Hammurabi and so forth. It'll spend a lot of good time on Egypt and the development of uh, organized religion and the art and architecture and all of that. It'll spend a great deal of time on Greece, which came afterwards, because Greece is where we trace back this idea of democracy. Greece is where we trace back a, a lot of philosophers really developing ideas of science and math. Certainly Socrates and Plato, but even the pre-Socratics are very important in this time. Eventually, some things happened. I'll give you the dime store tour of Western civilization here. Uh, the Roman Empire, you know, Greece is conquered. Alexander the Great unites a lot of Europe and a lot of even Western Asia. And the Roman Empire comes eventually into power. And they are immensely influenced by Greece, Greek culture. Greek culture has really been diffused out into a lot of the neighboring areas because of Alexander the Great. And the Roman Empire takes the ideas of Greece and they develop them a little bit, we get our idea of a republic. In America, in the United States, we are the republic for which it stands. You know, we are a republic with democratically elected officials. So we can really trace a lot of the ideas, and our founding fathers certainly did, back to Rome and Greece. And the Roman Empire, if you think about Europe, suddenly just connected everything. Even though there were still separate principalities and so forth, the roads connected everything. Suddenly the world was a lot smaller, you know, uh, figuratively speaking, because you could travel, you know, it was a big deal. And of course, within the Roman Empire, Christianity came about. Christ is born in the in the Roman Empire, and eventually, in, in 
Christianity develops. At first, Christians are persecuted heavily, but eventually Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. We develop the Roman Church from that. There's the, there's the Holy Roman Empire for a time. We still have the Holy Roman Catholic Church with us today. And schisms broke off of that. Schisms broke off of the schisms of the schisms of the schisms to the point where you have countless Christian churches today. But it can all, you know, be pointed back to that through that time period. So the Roman Empire eventually fell, though, it was very corrupt. It serves as a cautionary tale. We went from a republic to a lot of tyrants and, and the Caesars, it, you know, it, we can look at it, why it fell and have a lot of lessons learned. But as it fell, different uh, barbarian factions and warring you know, people came in to conquer this part and this part and this part. Suddenly, we don't have this uh, connected political world of the Roman Empire, but the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church still connects a lot of it. A lot of these barbarians who even conquer parts of Rome end up converting to Christianity. Particularly in France, France is considered the church's eldest daughter. That's a title that France has had throughout history. Certainly not anymore, but it's a, it's, a, it's a title that France has had because even with other countries falling, uh, whether it's paganism or the Protestant you know, um, split, when uh, certain countries will become Protestant and create their own churches and whatnot, France pretty much always stayed true to the Catholic Church. And that's going to come back to us later here in a moment. And this time period that I'm discussing now is what's called the Middle Ages. Uh, medieval Ages, it, it's, that doesn't make it evil. The, the medieval is a word meaning the Middle Ages. It's sort of an old English thing. But uh, a lot of people mistake that. Oh, the Evil Ages, Medieval Ages? No, not evil, just Middle Ages. Just call it that. Some people call it the Dark Ages. And this is where the history books really show their political agenda, a lot of them. You do a cursory search on anything about the Western civilization, the history of it, and the Middle Ages, oh, that's the dark times. That's the time when religion ruled and they were stymieing the sciences and nothing could really, you know, develop in, in art and in philosophy. Everything was just halted because of the evil Catholic Church. And it wasn't until the beautiful Renaissance era and the Enlightenment that, that people started to freely think and, and science and philosophy was once again developed and blah, 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 blah. That's simply BS. That's it. You can easily see the political agenda within that. It is true that a lot of advances and whatnot, to a certain extent, did have to halt during what we call the Middle Ages. There were plagues. There was no longer this uh, overall sense of peace with one connected political structure. There's wars, there's uh, political factions and whatnot, countries emerging, fighting each other. The Library of Alexandra in Greece is burned to the ground. And this held a lot of, of copies of philosophies and sciences and everything like that. But you still had the monks in monasteries really trying to meticulously copy and preserve a lot of these texts from Greece, uh, pagan texts even, you know, that's why we still have Beowulf with us and so forth. You know, it's owed to these monasteries. There are still wonderful philosophers and thinkers, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Erasmus, uh, Erasmus, excuse me. <laughs> uh, but we don't like to think, you know, made, secular culture doesn't like to think about them because they have that saint word, you know, they're, they're affiliated with the Catholic Church anyway. And nevertheless, they were still very much doing the work of science and, and human intellectual progress. You know? The Renaissance comes about, and Renaissance painters and, and philosophers, many of which are still Christian, still doing work for the Catholic Church even. Some of the most beautiful Renaissance paintings and sculptures are patroned and, and uh, you know, ordered by the Church. But the Enlightenment eventually comes about. Now, the Enlightenment... We do have a new access at this point to a lot of the classic works that had been lost and that were preserved by monasteries or found in Greece and so forth. We do have a, a return to a lot of the knowledge that you know had been lost you know, by a lot of people for the most part and built on. On the plus side of the Enlightenment, there are a lot of great scientific advancements because of that. And we still are living in that legacy today, one of the many legacies of the Enlightenment we live in. On the negative side, though, the Enlightenment particularly in Europe, really set about the mainstream idea or, or modern or making the idea mainstream of atheism. Now, before I get into that, let me just broach the subject that I'm particularly talking about Europe here, because 
in America, of course, the Enlightenment, we as United States citizens, we can trace our government back to our founding fathers who were immensely inspired by the Enlightenment ideals. Thomas Jefferson is writing uh, the Declaration of Independence based on the ideas of John Locke. Certainly George Washington, the father of our country, certainly James Madison, the father of our Constitution, would be considered Enlightenment individuals. The thing about the United States, though, the new world here, the Enlightenment over here never divorced itself from the idea of God. Now, it's true that a lot of our founding fathers wouldn't really consider themselves Christian in any sort of traditional way. But at the, at the most, it, they were at least deists. Deists like Jefferson and so forth still believed in a creator God, a, a creator God who was good, a good creator God who set the creation, his world up according to certain laws and certain natural orders and so forth. And that it was our job to learn those laws and orders, but submit to them as well. And, and that's a natural order, you know, laws like gravity and so forth but also a moral order that was involved in the idea of deism as well. Certainly not the same exact same moral order of say the Christian church or something like that, but still it was there. And I would argue that that is why the United States still exists today, founded on enlightenment values, but did not divorce itself from the idea of a creator. Now you can certainly say we've done that now. We can talk about the repercussions that have happened since then and so forth. That wasn't the case in Europe though. About a decade or so after our American Revolution, founded on the ideals of the Enlightenment, France had its French Revolution. Now, remember I said that France was considered the eldest daughter of the church. At the time, the French were living under a monarchy, and uh, the church itself held sway a lot in the government. You know, Catholic Church itself held, held sway a lot in the government of, French, of France. And both the monarchy and the church, there was, still, there was obviously heavy corruption in that as well, a lot of mismanagement. And the people rise up, according to these Enlightenment ideals, and the leaders of the Enlightenment fully embrace this idea of atheism, though. We need to divorce ourselves from the church, uh, any idea of, of a monarchy who rules by divine right. So we need to cut off any. We're all, you know, let's really develop in, in our own rights and so forth. And it ends in horror. The French Revolution, you can look up some stuff and, you know, find some information about it. It's just, you know, eventually it ends in what's called the Reign of Terror. At first, it's, yeah, let's, let's, um, they're, they're beheading their leaders, their, their king, their so forth. Not just killing, though, or beheading, uh, torturing, raping, dismembering. I mean, it's horrible, the frenzy that, of anger that people get worked up into until eventually even the leaders of the revolution themselves are executed by the revolution and, and murdered and so forth by the revolution. So it's just, it becomes just a giant bloodbath. And one of the things that happens in it, you have writers like the Marquis de Sade, you know, the man who we get the word sadism from, writing all of these uh, horribly licentious, evil texts about not just free love or sex, but rape and murder, you know, all together within it. Because that's this logical trajectory. There's there's what's called the sex horror trajectory. Once you say in the Enlightenment and the European Enlightenment, anyway, many of the thinkers were saying, let's do away with any moral order. Let's just embrace our own natures, our own natural natures. You know, let's look at science, nature, and let's look at our natural you know, motives and drives as well, which, of course, sexual drives are going to be the part of that. And, and we'll talk about that, some individual specific cases here in a moment. But it always leads to horror. It always leads to terror. Because in the minute one person says, I am very justified in totally objectifying you and using you for my pleasure, there's the escalation factor. You know, you think about it like with people who get hooked on pornography, for example. Uh, that thing I was looking at before doesn't do it for me. I need something a little more extreme, a little more extreme. And if you've allowed yourself to think of somebody else as just an object to give you sexual pleasure, eventually you're you're torturing eventually you're murdering you know just to get that little bit more extreme kick and so forth it, it happened it happened it's historical now the french revolution by the time of our night in 1816 is pretty much over napoleon had come to power even lost power and so forth but before we talk about mary shelley and percy and lord byron we need to say a little bit about their parents william godwin mary who would eventually be called Mary Shelley, her father, William Godwin, was a British man and an Enlightenment thinker. See, when the revolution's going on in France, 
Britain had already had little mini revolutions in terms of their monarchy. They were well on the way to a constitutional monarchy. People would argue about when this and that happened and so forth, but they weren't tyrannically ruled by a king and a church in the same way or to the extent that France was. So Britain as a whole looked on the French Revolution with a good bit of horror. They were aghast at all these things that were happening. Look what happens when you when you just deny your king and so forth. But you did have Enlightenment thinkers within Britain who were championing the French Revolution and these values and these ideas from the Enlightenment. William Godwin was one of them. He wrote a very famous pamphlet. He wrote some books and whatnot talking about how we need to throw off traditional values, uh, whether that's political, even religious. You know, we need to throw off this idea of a, of a Christian you know, system of morals, of order. We need to throw off institutions like marriage. Marriage is so ridiculous. People should just be free to, you know, go where their heart leads them and so forth. Mary Wollstonecraft, who would eventually be Mary Shelley's mother, was also an Enlightenment thinker. Now, she is constantly sort of strawmanned up by feminist theory as their, their great, wonderful matriarch, when many of the things she believed in, they would even be horrified by. But she did write a vindication of the rights of man and eventually a vindication of the rights of men and women. She believed in this Enlightenment ideal as well. In fact, she, long before she meets William Godwin, she even goes to Paris while the French Revolution is taking place with the idea that she's going to stick it to society by having an affair. She's going to go to France where it would be more socially acceptable to have an affair. And she's going to have this affair with a man and just sort of stick it to traditional society. She does that. She goes to Paris and is immediately struck by the danger there. I mean, people are being murdered and tortured right outside her window. She meets this American. I forget his first name, but his last name is Imlay, I-M-L-Y. And they start their affair. Interestingly enough, as the French Revolution becomes more and more dangerous, foreigners from Britain in particular are they're, they're, they're targeted in a lot of ways. So here we have Imlay and Mary Wollstonecraft who don't believe in the idea of marriage, who are doing what they're doing in their affair just to you know stick it to marriage. They go to the American embassy because Imlay is American and register Mary Wollstonecraft as his wife. They don't actually get married. But they register as his wife so that she can suddenly be Mrs. Emlay, the American, instead of Mary Wollstonecraft, the British you know, um, citizen who would have been, let's say, at the, at the very least, in the best case, you know, would have been ousted from the country. So they stay there. And then Mary Wollstonecraft is pregnant. Emlay leaves, abandons her, which is perfectly in line with the ideals and the, the philosophies that the two espoused to each other when they got together. But he abandons her there. So Wollstonecraft is left there, eventually has her daughter there in this incredibly dangerous climate in this country. And she writes a lot of heartbreaking letters to him, you know, trying to make him understand that, no, you do actually have a, a commitment to me that you must honor and so forth. So a lot of even, you know, when they try to live these ideals, they, they, they start to see how they break apart. Eventually, Mary Wollstonecraft makes it back to Britain, not before she tries to kill herself. Actually, twice she tries to kill herself again in Britain. But eventually she meets William Godwin. Now, William Godwin at this point has a lot of egg on his face. Remember, he's been writing in support of the French Revolution. By now, the reign of terror has taken place like everybody. It's just not even a question anymore. You can look and see that the French Revolution was a horribly bloody, terrible thing to happen. The way the Enlightenment thinkers try to justify it, though, is they say, well, look, a lot of horrible things happened and they shouldn't have happened. But the French people were under so much tyranny for so long that they really just had to get that out of their system. So it's OK if you just kept letting it you know, develop that the French Revolution had been allowed to breathe. They would have gotten that out of their system and eventually settled down into our wonderful communist utopia or whatever that the Enlightenment uh, was trying to eventually work toward are these Enlightenment thinkers, which we're trying to eventually work toward. So Godwin had a good deal of egg on his face, but he's trying to maintain as much as possible. Wollstonecraft, you know, coming back to English society as a unwed mother, has a bit of problems to work out herself. She meets William Godwin, sparks fly. They, here's the interesting thing, they decide to get married. Again, flies in the face of everything the two of them believe. Why would they try and do this? But they go to the 
English church, the Anglican church, and have it have become married within the English church. So they're married. And then, of course, Mary Shelley is born. Mary Wollstonecraft dies within a month after Mary is born. It's believed that she, if you look at the documentation and whatnot at the time, letters and such, she dies from an infection that she caught from the from the birth. They didn't have the most sterile conditions. You know, childbirth was a was a perilous thing for a lot of women and so forth. So she her mother dies. Young Mary grows up with her father there. Her father eventually remarries and has a, a half sister who is believed what's believed to be a half sister for Mary. Her name is Claire. Now we go ahead and call her Claire Claremont, though, because it eventually comes out that William wasn't the father. <laughs> she is his new wife and had this child by another man. Again, once you throw out these traditional values and institutions, chaos, right? So, but it's believed at the time, and that's important, or at least it's asserted at the time that Claire is Mary's half sister by William growing up there. Okay. Now we have a young Percy Shelley who. In a lot of ways, Mary eventually based Victor Frankenstein on Percy. He grows up experimenting on his sisters. They are, in some ways, he's just very sociopathic. Uh, using them, you know, electrocuting them, playing out these, these different experiments. They're all very inspired or, or intrigued by Galvin, Galvinism. The idea of, of harnessing lightning, which of course comes from Ben Franklin at first, you know, uh, the ideas of it and such. He starts to write. He is what's called part of the second generation of the Romantics. The Romantic era, it's a group of writers, poets, you know, this era we look back on. And it's often misleadingly described as sort of a reaction against the Enlightenment. Now, that's true enough for the first generation of the Romantics, that what, the, what are called the light Romantics, what Samuel Taylor Coleridge, William Wordsworth, William uh, Blake. They are very much saying, look, you can't deny that we have passion and emotions. We, we should very much in, investigate and, and allow our passions and our emotions and our feelings and our soul. They fly in the face of the Enlightenment and really go back to following our our feelings back to a God, uh, whether that's a Christian God or just the idea of a God, but they do believe in a creator God who is good. This is the first generation of romantics in Britain. Percy is part of the second generation of romantics. In terms of the writers, they're usually represented by Percy Shelley, Lord Byron, um, John Keats, or yeah, Keats. I mixed up his first name there. But the second generation of romantics love the idea of the enlightenment that we should throw off the idea of god that we should throw off the idea of these traditional values marriage and government and all these things we should just be free to do whatever we want they love that idea and percy wasn't a wonderful poet he truly is you can look at his poet the, the, all of these individuals were masterful writers they had a lot of great talent but percy was a pretty sick individual he eventually marries a young woman named harriet and tries to get her to form a commune with him, of which they can all share wives. He tries, he writes to a, a school teacher and starts sort of a affair by pen pal uh, going on with her, has her leave her job and, and move to him so he can start this sort of commune, but his wife won't have any of it. So this poor school teacher woman is left without a job, abandoned and so forth. He tries to get his wife to sleep with some of his friends. He loves this idea of free love. He reads a lot of Enlightenment thinkers, Adam Wipeshot, I always pronounce his name wrong, who talks about, among others, you can go very much a lot deeper into these topics, obviously. I'm crushing semesters upon semesters into just a you know 20-minute talk here, 30-minute talk, whatever. But he is enamored with this idea that sort of starts to blend the occultism into ideas of the Enlightenment. We can... We can perceive, we can bring to fruition our ideas and our longings for revolution if we engage in actions that drastically go against the, nat the, the previous order. So he, he was very much, uh, Percy's very much into the ideas of incest and so forth. He goes to pay homage to Godwin because he likes Godwin's works, and he meets Mary. Mary is a great deal younger than him, I think 14 or 16 or something at the first point when they meet. He's about 20-ish. 
and they begin an affair. Mary and Percy begin an affair. William Godwin is horrified by this. You would think he'd be okay with it, right? Mr. Free Love, Mr. What's Marriage and all of that. But he's horrified by it. Mary gets pregnant by Percy and gives birth to a baby girl who's eventually, uh, I can't remember if she was stillborn or she dies shortly after the birth, which devastates Mary. All the while, Percy's still married to Harriet and having kids by her. Eventually, Percy tries to kill himself a couple of times because he just can't live without Mary, can't live without her. Eventually, he absconds with Mary and they run away to Europe. They bring along Mary's half-sister, Claire, who I mentioned, you know, considered everyone thinks she's her half-sister, because Percy wants a little menage a trois with these sisters. Again, bringing that incestuous kind of a cultish moment to bring his revolutionary ideas into fruition. Percy has Claire write to Lord Byron to develop a Lord Byron's the other great, you know, second generation uh, romantic author of the day, poet of the day to develop an affair with him. So that Claire and Lord Byron have a thing because Percy would like to bring Lord Byron into this sort of wife swapping communal, you know, ritualistic <laughs> thing that he wants to have there. Now, Lord Byron's not necessarily into that, but he's not going to turn down a free woman, you know, throwing herself at him. Lord Byron's got his own issues. He has had a child with his sister, his own incestuous issues in England. So much controversy. Again, I'm just skating over this. You can go through many specifics. Every time I talk about anything on my channel, there's always comments going, I know stuff too. I can't believe you didn't talk about this. Obviously, guys, I'm skating over this, trying to sum up, just give you the overall narrative. Lord Byron, a lot of controversy, famous, famous writer. They, they really are the poets in those days are the rock stars of the day. They don't have television. They don't have radio. They don't have music that can be, you know, given around, but they do have paper. And so poems can be circulated and so forth. So they are the rock stars of the day, Percy and Byron in particular. So Byron, a lot of controversy, slept with his sister. He leaves and goes to Europe as well to get to escape the controversy. His family pays this young doctor by the name of John Polidori to go with him. Polidori is a very talented doctor of the time, but you have to be a certain age. You have to be 20 something. And John Polidori isn't quite that. I think he's only 20 at this point uh, in order to, practice medicine and actually ha open up your own practice and whatnot in England. So at least the the Byron, uh, Lord Byron's family pays John Polidori to attend Lord Byron on this journey to Europe. Hopefully he won't do anything silly like kill himself because he misses his sister wife. So anyway, that's where John Polidori and Lord Byron are in Switzerland at the time. Percy, with designs in his own mind for what's going to take place, has Mary and Claire accompanying him there. They all stay in this castle. As I said before, dark, stormy, cold summer. There's stories of the castle to the south of them where a very real Dr. Frankenstein is said to have, you know, tried to make these experiments and dig up bodies and, and all of these stories. Ideas of galvanism and harnessing lightning is sort of the source of life are, are in the ether at the time. Mary's taking all of this in. This night changes everything. A lot of things happen on this night or maybe a space of nights if you want to stretch it over there. It's really only a few weeks that all of them stay together. Eventually some other individuals come and, and Percy and Mary end up leaving and whatnot. But it's an important moment because like I said, the idea for the story of Frankenstein's developed and the idea of the vampire, which would go on to inspire Dracula in many ways is developed. We'll talk more about Dracula in particular when we actually start to talk about the novel Bram Stoker's Dracula and the universal films and some of the ways Dracula has influenced our culture. We will get to that. Uh, some on this podcast and also a lot on my own channel, some of the live streams and videos and so forth. But for Mary's part, she starts to suddenly realize a little bit that Percy's affections maybe aren't unconditional. You know, they're taking a lot of laudanum. It's a drug fueled orgy fest you know, in a lot of ways there at that castle in the summer. Percy has a vision of Mary with eyes where her nipples should be. And this horrifies him, makes him run out of the room. And of course, you can psychoanalyze that in a lot of ways. I mean, this is the person he's trying to objectify or use who's suddenly looking back to him. The part of her that he's trying to objectify and use what is supposed to be the life giving, nurturing part of her is looking back at him sort of a judgmental eye. We can psychoanalyze it. Maybe that's not your thing, whatever, but it's really freaky things are going on here and he's horrified by Mary for a time. He's still sleeping with Claire at the same time, you know, 
And you can see in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein a, a lot of guilt and even criticism a little bit. Now, she never wrote about this or said this openly, but it's really there in the book. When they do eventually go back to Britain, Fanny Imlay, Mary Shelley's half-sister, if you remember, she's the child that Mary Wollstonecraft bore while she was in France during the French Revolution at the time. She was abandoned with this child. They get back to Britain and Fanny, her half-sister, kills herself. And she leaves a note. It's because she didn't feel like she was a second-class citizen in the family and you know, didn't really feel that unconditional sense of love. Because, again, that family's all about just you know, going out for themselves and, and to heck with this traditional values like family and so forth. You, you follow your own urges and so forth. Fanny Imlay kills herself. Later, and that's in October of that year. So this was the summer of 1816, October. Fanny, Mary's half-sister, kills herself. In December, Percy's wife, whom he ran away with or ran away from with another woman, is found dead, drowned in the river, who has killed herself as well. Mere days, mere days after Percy's wife is found dead, having killed herself, Mary and Percy get married in the English church. And there's some thoughts as to why they did that. Mary insisted upon it. We know that much. But maybe it was because Percy could more easily gain rights to his children he had with Harriet if they were married and so forth. Percy blames Harriet's suicide on her family. Her family didn't treat her right. Like, are you kidding me? If anybody's just, you know, guilty of not treating her right, it's you, you dog. So there's a lot of guilt, a lot of guilt in Mary. And, and you can see this come through in the themes of Frankenstein once she writes it all out and puts it together. There's the responsibility a creator owes to their creation. You know, the, the Frichter gives life to this being and drops the ball on all the responsibility he owes to it and, and the horror that ensues and the things. And isn't that doesn't can't you lay that at the feet of Victor? And where's the culpability for Victor and the things he did and so forth? I mean, you really dig into it and can go a great distance with that. It's a fascinating piece. It's also an indictment. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is an indictment on many, in many ways on this sort of godless enlightenment thinking. We're going to stop there. We're not really going to dig too much deeper into Frankenstein yet because that'll be for future. I don't know exactly where this divisions are going to end up for the next episode of this podcast, but you can follow me on YouTube, Professor Geek, and we'll be talking about this a lot more going in order, delving into Frankenstein a bit more eventually looking at Dracula and how that came from Polidori and, and so forth. So we're going to continue to look at that. But these creatures, even if you're not into a Frankenstein or Dracula story, the anxieties that they represent, because horror holds up a mirror to our anxieties, even in a culture that won't admit it. If you revel in stories where your monster is like this, whether you admit it or not, there's some anxiety about, hey, maybe we're miss. Maybe, you know, there's a lot of zombie movies right now. Maybe there's a little bit of anxiety about all of our scientific advancements and gene splicing and disease cultivation and so forth. So horror doesn't lie. The popular horror is going to tell the tale of what's going on in society. And, and today, living in our society, which is still very much a product of the Enlightenment, it's still with us today, its philosophies and so forth we can trace a lot of our anxieties and our horror stories back to the original horror stories originally spawned by the enlightenment. That one night, that one fateful magic night, maybe a few nights, no more than a week at least in this castle in this dark, cold, stormy summer in which these brilliant, brilliantly talented young people are just living a debaucherous lifestyle and the guilt, the fear, the anxiety, blasts through their subconscious and and creates these stories it's fascinating it really is fascinating talked a lot we'll stop there and we'll come back with our physical media reviews in a moment hey Simon Grover here just wanted to pop in and say hi and to let you know that the music for the Iconocast podcast is composed by yours truly if you like original electronic music check out my website at soundengraver.com I also have content on my YouTube channel, Sound Engraver. I mainly do music and sound experimentation. I work in Logic Pro, Super Collider, but I also talk about art because I like that kind of stuff. So if any of that interests you, stop by my channel or my website, drop a message. I'd love to say hi. And now back to the iconic Professor Geek.
as I said, our physical me re media reviews this time around are linked to the topic I just talked about this one night, this summer of 1816. There are only, to my knowledge, two movies that have been made in terms of feature films, fictionalized accounts about only these events around this summer. There's a lot of, you know, BBC documentaries or, or you know, biopic biopics of the of Byron or Shelley or so forth that might cover the summer within, you know, a life plan or something. Plenty of documentaries and so forth. But in terms of artistic films, feature length films, I only know of two. Uh, maybe I should do a little more research before I say that. Maybe there's some others. But these are certainly the two most popular. First, we have Gothic. And this is by Ken Russell. Ken Russell is a surrealist or surrealist uh, filmmaker. He did the Who's Tommy, uh, you know, Salome and so forth. Very surreal film. As you see, the cover there is a recreation, a recreation of Henry Fuseli's The Nightmare, which plays a part. It was a romantic uh, era painting, which was inspiring to Byron and the crew and would have been spoken about there quite a bit. And it's a, it's a very surrealistic story about one night in particular where you've got Lord Byron, Percy, Mary Shelley, Claire Claremont, John Polidori, uh, drug fueled to the max. And they all decide to have a, a seance where they want to conjure up their greatest fears. And of course, these are fictionalized accounts. They're not all historically accurate. But I think in terms of explorations of the of the magnitude of this night or summer or whatever, I think they're pretty well done. Now, the, as I said, Gothic is a surrealistic take. You do want to know your references or at least just kind of go with it and look things up. For example, at one point, Lord Byron is in his room and he's got this plaster cast of a mask, just this face mask sitting on this pedestal and it has, has a gusta underneath it. And he calls in the, one of his house, his maids, Justine, Justine, come in here. And she comes in, immediately takes off all of her clothes and he puts the mask on her face and then begins to kiss her stomach and so forth. And, and you'd be like, what the heck is going on here? But Augusta was the sister that he had a child with that he ran away from. And in his mind, he's like, oh, she's the love of my life. So he has this maid wear the face cast mask of his sister to make love to her, make love, whatever, to her, to pretend it's it's, it's weird, it's trippy. Uh, the, the maid's name herself is named Justine, which is a famous work by the Marquis de Sade. Very twisted, horrible work that Mary Shelley at one point is flipping through in the bedroom and you see the illustrations, the highly sexualized, you know, uh, illustrations and terrorizing, you know, torturing, murdering, raping and so forth. So, so a lot of, a lot of little, you know, ends and references that maybe you won't catch all of them, but it's a good place to start. It's a great film. If you don't mind a surrealistic take, if you want a little bit more of a traditional type film, a traditional story of what's going on that night, then there's a haunted summer, which came out just another like, year or two later. And this, uh, of course, you see Eric Stoltz, Laura Dern, Alex Winter, you know, Bill from Bill and Ted uh, in Lost Boys. He plays John Polidori wonderfully. So the cast is amazing in both of these movies, but this is a great one. A little bit more of a traditional story tells the story of the summer. Th this one in particular tries to treat Shelley as a bit more of a just sort of a naive innocent, which he wasn't. But again, they're they're taking liberties with their they're trying to tell a fictitious fictitious story so they're going to take a lot of poetic license i think both movies are pretty good explorations of what happened this summer now i have as you see just the dvds and these are fine i i don't need a blu-ray as i've said to movies that were made before things were shot in high def because i want to see them as they would have been seen on the screen in those days now the problem though is that these dvds to my knowledge are all formatted full screen now, for you youngins, if you don't know what I'm talking about, full screen format and so forth, televisions, before we had these flat screen and HD televisions and whatnot, they used to be square. The screen of a TV was square. But of course, if you go to a movie theater, the dimensions of a movie theater screen are rectangle. And films were shot in a rectangle format. I'm just being very kind of basic here for you. I'm not going to use the numbers or the scales or anything like that. So when you wanted to show a film that was shot as a rectangle on a television station, for example, what did you do? Because you're trying to, you're dealing with a square and then a rectangle. So most often what they did was they take the rectangle and they would just put the square in the middle. They would lop two sides of the rectangle off 
just to show you at least the square portion. And that would at least fill up the square TV screen. So that's what's called full screen. Now, if you're like me and you didn't like that, what you looked for was the films that were called letterboxed. And letterboxed means that here's your square. They take the, the rectangle and they bring it out, you know, uh, pan back enough to they can so they can fit the whole rectangle within the square. But of course, that's going to leave you with two large black spaces on the top and bottom. That they were called letterboxed movies. I prefer that. I prefer to see all of the mise en scene, everything in the composition that the director wanted me to see. I don't like lopping off the sides. Uh, but that was commonly done. Unfortunately, these DVD versions I have are full screen. They're lopping off parts of the screen. I don't like it. It's commonly done all the time. Uh, today, it's not as big of an issue anymore because, of course, our televisions are rectangles and you can get different ratios and so forth. Uh, there is at least a Blu-ray version of Gothic, but it's a little pricey. And, and I didn't have the money to really go grab it just for this episode. I will eventually get it. It's on my Christmas list. Uh, but a, a good Blu-ray that that is in full, you know, you get the whole... Um, film dimensions that it was originally shot in it has some cool special uh, features as well these are just basic dvds the movies there that's it maybe some subtitles <laughs> you know that's it but i'm glad i have them because i'm glad i have at least a way to watch the original graininess you know of it and i will upgrade to, upgrade to blu-rays when i can i don't know if haunted summer off the top of my head has a blu-ray available uh I can't remember if it was just available, but very expensive, or if they haven't actually made a Blu-ray of that yet. I don't know. I have to look into that. So that's my physical media review. I wanted to talk about some movies that are related to our main topic that you can check out. Uh, the, these DVDs are easy to get. They're not expensive. Use sellers, whatever. You can find it uh, online. And I think the movies are available on some streaming services as well, and certainly available to rent. So look up Gothic or Haunted Summer if you want to see some films about this profound, disturbing night or this summer that I say truly did change culture. So that's all for that. We'll be back with our last segment in a moment. Hi, folks. This is Matt Wilkins from the self-titled YouTube channel, Matt Wilkins. I want to invite you to come listen to the channel. We talk about the Star Wars Expanded Universe, board games. I have two podcasts that go on YouTube and iTunes called Prince of the Universe, where we talk about movies, TV, anything geeky and in the past we want to talk about. And then Saturday morning, Sam and Flange, we give a top five of some random subject every week. So why don't you come on and check it out. That's Matt Wilkins on YouTube. Now to turn our attention to Heroic archetypes, totally shifting gears from, from horror and all of that stuff. We're going back to our heroic archetypes because it's a series that I started. I said I, I wanted to carry it through to the end of the year, maybe one month over the end of the year since I lost August episode there. But we're going to continue with that. Once again, people who've watched my YouTube channel for years now might be somewhat familiar with the content I'm going to give you here. I am going to show you the featured video that I had already put together, edited, uh, at least you can hear the audio or so forth, talking about the sub-archetype of the frontiersman. But as I always do, I'd like to give a little recap and just sort of contextualize where we are with the frontiersman. We've talked about the idea of the monomyth, the hero's journey in general. Joseph Campbell, you know, identifying this formula that was already in stories, mythologies, folklores, and everything from you know any time period, any part of the world identifies it as the hero's journey. Lots of different comparative mythologists have come along and, and amended or added to or taken away from the steps, you know, and so forth. But it's called the monomyth, the hero's journey. And then we talked about a specifically American view of the monomyth, the American monomyth. What are certain attributes in our sort of Western world, American Hollywood culture story that get placed into this monomyth hero's journey and a lot of it is the christ figure because again we're still founded on those christian ideals at some level they're they're ingrained in our culture and in uh, certainly in america and so we we do want a a hero who is self-sacrificing who's willing to give of himself for others even lay down his life for others if need be then we talked about origins of heroes you there's two parts to a hero's origin they have the the empowerment and the call to action or call to adventure and so forth. We talked about the different qualifiers, the destiny driven, the tragedy and so forth. So those are on previous episodes. If you missed it, you can go back and listen to the last segment of any previous episode on YouTube. They're on a playlist or the other podcast platforms and so forth. Last month's episode, we looked at the first of our, or we also looked at the 
two basic types of heroes you can have. Once we're in the American monomyth, we can either have the aspirational hero or the cathartic motivational hero. And these are just two overarching uh, divisions. You know, they're, they're specific different types of heroes, the aspirational or the cathartic motivational. Within those two divisions, we can have any number of the sub archetypes. And that's the first one we looked at last month's episode with the trickster. We talked about the important ways that the trickster, just as a character, a mythological character in general, serves culture, the things it does, the ways it can actually harm culture and so forth. And this time around, we're going to look at the frontiersman. And I think that the frontiersman is an important one to bring about after the trickster, because you remember we said that the trickster blurs boundaries. So you think about it, Let's just think about it in terms of the founding of America. Uh, for good or for bad, a lot of boundaries were blurred. You had Europeans coming to a new land that was already inhabited by an indigenous, indigenous people. But land was taken or it was bought or it was worked around, you know, and more often than not, it was taken and more and more and more taken and so forth. Then it's taken from other countries who claimed it and so forth. There's a blurring of boundaries, the, a trickster aspect going on which gives us this idea of manifest destiny. It's our destiny as Americans to go all the way to the West Coast and so forth. So a trickster aspect blurs the boundaries. What happens immediately when you have a blurred boundary is that you're left with a frontier. Now, I'm going to give you a physical example of this. You may think of the American frontier, even early on. You know, uh, Jefferson makes the Louisiana Purchase. Suddenly, you know, vast portion of, you know, middle America or Midwest is, is now part of the United States but it's not even explored. It's not settled by Europeans anyway, or, or Americans, so to speak. It's still settled by a lot of indigenous peoples and whatnot. And that's considered a frontier. Anytime the frontier opened, you'd have families going out and trying to make a farm, make a living on a frontier, but it's still very un unsafe. It's unsafe not only because of native tribes already there, but also unsafe because there's really no sense of law yet. The civilization really hasn't really landed and sunk their teeth in. So whether we're talking about you know, American frontier, you know, in the, the Virginia territories and stuff like that, or rather we're talking about the Wild West. It's the same thing. So we need frontiersmen heroes to go into those those areas and make it safe for people. The frontiersman's not there to justify the taking of this area or not, but the area is there now and it needs to be made safe for all individuals there. That's what the frontiersman does. Now that's quite literally what it does on a map, but you can think of that figuratively as well. If the trickster influence in our society blurs some boundaries and suddenly this new thing is accepted within our culture, well, there needs to be some some logic coming to it and some rules and some, you know, uh, sense of order to it so people don't get hurt with these new ideas and so forth. You know, I can give you a bunch of examples, but I don't want to go for too far into it. I've got this video that you can watch. And uh, we'll go ahead and cut to that now. <laughs> so I won't end up saying anything that I'm going to end up repeating. But I think it's it's worth it. I think it's worth to watch. Even if you saw it a long time ago, give yourself a refresher. It's an important character type, the frontiersman. They're still with us today. Space is our final frontier. You know, characters like Green Lantern and so forth are just intellectual frontiersmen, you know, out there uh, treading new territory. So give the video a watch and I'll come back and wrap up. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Geek. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about the Frontiersman. If you missed the video on the Trickster, I have a link for that in the top right hand corner. And as I said in that video, I am making a list of all of these explorations that come out of my own scholarship about the archetypes and sub-archetypes of modern day heroes and characters in our comics, films, and television. We talked about the Trickster and how he blurred boundaries. And the tricksters are important in culture to come about every now and then to change up some of the things we've accepted as tradition or long held beliefs and blur the boundaries of some of our perceptions. And that causes us to question them and look at them anew. Sometimes we realize, yes, this is something we still want to hold to. And other times we realize it's something we want to think about a little bit differently. That is the use of a trickster through mythology. The Frontiersman is different, and the Frontiersman is uniquely relevant today in a lot of ways. If the trickster blurs boundaries, the Frontiersman straddles boundaries. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. A lot of cultures throughout time and across the world have had stories of explorers 
They go out in new lands and come back with their tales. They're always popular because they're exotic. They tend to be adventurous. But the American frontiersman has a unique niche that's come to be the norm with our exportation of popular culture in Hollywood, in many ways anyway. The United States throughout history has had this idea of manifest destiny. And that was the idea from the very beginning of the colonies on the East Coast there, that they would one day extend the border of the United States all the way to the Pacific coast, that that was just their destiny, their God-given destiny to own that land as the United States. Not every single politician or citizen at that point believed that, but that was just this general idea, and that's what you'll see it called in the history books, Manifest Destiny. Of course, in achieving that goal, many atrocities were committed. Horrible things were done to the American Indian tribes. was not a fair play situation by any means. It's interesting, though, that the stories that still hold to our culture from that time period, our different points within those time periods, are not about the politicians. They're not the stories that glorify the generals. They're not those stories. And they, there have been stories like that. Andrew Jackson, for example, was a general who committed all kinds of horrible things against the American Indians and won a lot of victories against different tribes. And they tried to spin that into a mythos when he was running for president, and it it worked even. He was elected president. But you don't know Andrew Jackson's name now unless you're interested in American history or you've ever looked very closely at a $20 bill. But frontiersmen do stay in the culture. People most likely know the name Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, Hawkeye from The Last of the Mohicans. Even though those first two were real characters in, in history, who didn't always act necessarily heroic in terms of the American monomyth, they've been mythologized to act that way. So there's a story and mythology that has been built up around them, and that fits into the mold. You would think that the frontier would be a territory for the trickster, because it's a blurred boundary. This new land has been acquired somehow or another, but it's a blurred boundary. There are still tribes laying claims to it, and, and how are things going? And you're right, the frontiersman is a trickster territory in that manner, but the trickster creates that territory. The trickster can't make it safe. The frontiersman has to come in and make it safe because the frontiersman says, okay, we're not blurring the boundaries anymore. These two boundaries, these two peoples, these two ideologies, these two cultures, whatever the case may be, these two things exist and they need to continue to exist as they are in themselves. They just have to do so together now. So that's what I mean by the frontiersman straddling boundaries. I'm saying a lot of abstract ideas here. Let me use a concrete example to explain what I mean. One of the works that I look at in my course when we look at the Frontiersman, an early work anyway to get a basis, is The Last of the Mohicans that I mentioned. That book is sent during the French and Indian War, so we have the English colonists at the time that would later become the United States. They are battling the French, who have recruited many of the American Indian tribes onto their side. A few tribes and a few natives will help out the English from time to time. So in the conflict of the French and Indian War in that book, we soon are introduced to Hawkeye, as he's called in this title. And he is a young English colonist, a young man who was raised for a certain portion of his life in the colony, but then was raised by the Delaware Indian tribe. And they raised him to adulthood, and he learned their ways of surviving, tracking, existing out in the woods, and so forth. And he becomes our frontiersman then because he straddles the boundary. The frontiersmen characters are important because they go out into that frontier, into that newly purchased or newly stolen piece of land or territory or whatever, and they, they're they not out there to conquer anymore. They're not out there arguing for the justice of it being taken in the first place or anything. They're out there just to make it safe, and they bring safety to either settlers who are going out there to settle the land or the tribes out there who are still living in the land. They're a, they're a peacemaker. And they do this by straddling boundaries. In these strict frontiersman stories, they have one foot in the colonists' or settlers' world, and they have another foot in the native tribes' world. Hawkeye straddles boundaries in that he is a European, English colonist, but he was raised by the Delaware Indians. He makes a point a number of times throughout the book to call himself a man without a cross. And some people who try to read an agenda into the work or don't quite know any better, they will say that, oh, the man without a cross, he's saying that he's a man without religion. The real meaning of that, though, if you look at the context and you look at what he's saying, is he's pointing out time and again that he is not of both Native American blood and colonist or European blood. He is a man without a cross in his blood. He's a pure-bred 
English colonist, but he was raised in the Delaware culture. You think, well, why does that matter so much? It matters because that would have made him a trickster. If he had those boundaries blurred within him, he doesn't. Instead, throughout the book, you will see him constantly ascribe certain things he does to either his European white colonist heritage or his Delaware Indian upbringing. He's pointing out that I can do this because of this. I can do that because of that. If he has the Mohicans around with him and it's time for tracking, he will allow them to go and he will defer to their authority on that because it's bred into their blood, you know, more so. And there is a subtle racism inherent in this idea, the racial pride or racial preference for gifts and so forth. There's a subtle racism built into that as well. But we're talking about a book that was written in the beginning of the United States history. So it was a book of his time. Having said that, though, it is a book ahead of its time in many ways in that it does present blurring of the bloodlines quite a bit. Cora, for example, is a strong, fascinating character in the book and moves and does a lot of things in the work. And she is revealed to be the daughter of her father, an English general, and one of his slaves that he'd had. And then she ends up developing a romance with Uncas, who is one of the Mohicans there with Hawkeye. So the book doesn't shy away from interracial relations by any means. But Hawkeye makes a point of saying this over and over because he's just demonstrating the fact that he is a frontiersman. He in himself is showing how these two cultures could exist together. They could use the strengths and weaknesses of each other, they could coexist were it not for the violence and the hatred and so forth. That is how the frontiersman straddles boundaries and doesn't blur them. Tarzan, another great frontiersman, because he is a Englishman of English blood in the novels, but he's raised by the apes in the jungle, so he has his foot in both of those worlds as well, and the books, and the books in particular, are very clear about saying he does this and this and this because of his human instincts, his instincts as being of this blood, but he does this and this and this because he was raised in the wild and by these beasts and knows their nature. So frontiersman characters continue to be popular, as I said, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone. Eventually, when the frontier was pushed to the west, then we had stories of the Wild West. Cowboys became our frontiersmen, and they're out there, the regulators. If you've ever seen Young Guns mythologizing the story of Billy the Kid and cohorts, that idea that we're here to regulate because injustice is being done out here, so we're here to, to make sure that stays clear. Even when they are deputized marshals or so forth within the American government, they're not government people. They are people who have the authority. They have that one foot in that world, like Wyatt Earp or someone like that. But then they also have the foot in the world of the Wild West. They understand the territory. They understand the culture. They can ally themselves with the Doc Holidays and so forth. So the cowboys became huge frontiersmen. Eventually, the frontiersmen pushed all the way to the Pacific coast. And you might think, well... Wouldn't that be the end of the frontiersman stories? Not necessarily, because take the 50s and early 60s, for example. This was a time period when certainly frontiers had been reached in the world. But our culture, our science, our technology, society in general was on the verge of major breakthroughs. This was post-war, and there was a lot of optimism about the future and the futuristic world that was to come. And one of the ways to cope with that and to figure it out was for culture to turn back to those frontiersman tales. Cowboy stories were immensely popular in the 50s and early 60s. Even old frontiersman stories. The Davy Crockett show was on and very popular at the time. There was even a television show of The Last of the Mohicans. Coupled with those stories were science fiction tales. But if you look at the science fiction tales, especially those golden age science fiction stories, they're frontiersman tales. They're cowboy stories set in space. You can't watch any episode of Star Trek, the original series, and tell me that Captain Kirk isn't just a cowboy wrangling his posse through uncharted territory. That's the formula. That's what people wanted to hear. Those are the types of stories that they were looking to to deal with and cope with all of these new changes that were coming into their culture. Not necessarily into their geography, but into their culture and into their technology and society in general. A frontiersman character will help them straddle those boundaries. Both of those types of stories are still popular today. In the comic books, you have frontiersmen everywhere. Green Lantern is the perfect comic book frontiersman. He has his foot firmly in the world of Earth and then firmly in the world of the Guardians out there in the galaxies. Speaking of Guardians and galaxies, the Guardians of the Galaxy, Peter Quill, a great frontiersman, has one foot firmly planted in American culture, as dated as it is, and then the other in the perils of space. Frontiersmen help us navigate 
new territory. They help us to straddle boundaries. And in straddling it, tricksters can be dangerous. Tricksters are useful, and we need tricksters. But if all you do is spend your time with a trickster, you don't have any solid ground to stand on. Tricksters shake things up, and that's necessary. But you need to transition at some point from a trickster to a frontiersman. And back again, of course. But you need to go back to frontiersman and say, okay, things are shaking up a little bit. This is how I'm thinking of the world, or this is how I'm thinking of this thing, or whatever it is now. But now I'm going to need this frontiersman here to show me, okay, one foot goes firmly here and one foot goes firmly there. Because you can only wobble over a blurred boundary, but so much before you fall down. There needs to be some concrete form to existence and to society, and to two different things, ideas, peoples, cultures, or whatever getting along and coexisting. The frontiersman is crucial to that. I'll wrap this up here. Again, it's a heady topic. That wraps up our episode. I hope you enjoyed it a lot. It's a long episode, but I think it's some really important stuff. I will cut it up, at least on YouTube, and put it out in some more digestible uh, videos anyway. But thank you for supporting the podcast. Thank you for supporting my YouTube channel. I uh, love doing this, and we are going to continue to talk about this Halloween content, this horror issues, you know, tracing these archetypes down, you know, in terms of horror archetypes, monster archetypes. And we'll continue as we uh, just did on the heroic archetypes explanation and exploration of that as well. So that's all I've got this time. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hanging out and giving the whole watching till the end of it. <laughs> I do appreciate that. Uh, you can leave your questions there uh, in the, the comment section, or I do have the email for this podcast. Eventually I will get enough compiled for a and a section or something like that. But until next time, try and stay cool in this horribly hot, disgusting summer. Let's all wait for October patiently. <laughs> but, but as far as we're concerned, the Halloween season is here. We're, we're doing it. It's Halloween time. So uh, thanks for watching. Until next time, keep enjoying and digging deeper into these true blue archetypal stories that we love. <laughs>